worship your holy name. Lord, I worship your holy name. God is good. Welcome to our worship this morning. Uh, it's good to be back with you. Uh, 
mostly. It's good to be back with you. It's never easy to, it's never easy to leave the mountains of Colorado. And we'll be sharing about the trip, uh, we'll be sharing about the trip after the Carol Joy church campers have had their experiences as well, so we can do all of those things together. We're going to be doing that in August, uh, but uh, incredible week. It's always hard to leave the Rockies, but, uh, but, it is, uh, but it is good to be back among you, and we all made it back uh, safely, uh, some cuts and bruises aside. Um, no, major, uh, no major injuries or long-sustained damages, um, and uh, wonderful to be back here and worship with all of you. The flowers uh, here on the altar, uh, Lola Christensen, uh, mother of Jeff Christensen, uh, passed away recently, and uh, there are flowers here from her service. Uh, we continue to hold Jeff and his family in our prayers, and, and also there are flowers here uh, at the front of the church from the services for Steve Jardine, and uh, we absolutely uh, hold Jardine family in our prayers as well. Please, in addition to them, uh, continue to hold Bob Priest in your prayers as he continues to rehab, uh, uh, to rehab in the skilled care unit uh, for St. Francis. And with that, uh, we continue our worship with our opening words of welcome. Almsgiving, then, is always a means for positioning myself in the world. I place my money, and thus myself, for money is a symbol of my power, in service to what stands above or below me, depending on whether and how I save it and spend it. Here lies a deep truth about the sacred circulation of money, be it almsgiving or tithing. The issue is not obligation. The issue is responsibility. Not enforcement, but valuation. Tithing and its corollaries can perhaps be best understood as weighing of values, an attempt to find one's place in the cosmic network. It is also a measure against which one strives, against which one balances the other demands of life, paying the rent, financing the car, going on vacation. These words from Philip Zaleski on the subject of our giving to God and what that giving conveys. Our first reading this morning relates to Paul's admonitions to the church in Corinth. The church in Corinth had come to embrace and began to pursue a very ambitious, ambitious project of support financially for Christians in places of persecution and struggle that we're facing great trials. And all of us continue uh, to face that challenge in many and various ways within our own lives. Let us stand as we join in singing. eyes of my heart, Lord, open the eyes of my heart, I want to see you, I want to see you, open the eyes of my heart, Lord, open the eyes of my heart, I want to see you, I want to see you. I want to see you. I want to 
confession, uh, after our confession and forgiveness during the song that follows, uh, all will be invited forward to the font uh, to take a slip of the paper that is there on the baptismal font table and hold it for a few moments and then place it in the water that is in the bowl. We continue by offering our confession. Gracious Lord, all around us are the marks of our brokenness in the flawed systems and human institutions through which we seek to administer justice and provide support in the uncharitable ways we sometimes speak of or even just think of others in the ways we hoard and in the ways that we fail to trust in the hunger and need that we have permitted and come to accept as normal, in the ways we lash out from fear or doubt or pain. Yet we know that by your grace and presence, we can find forgiveness for our human condition. Restore us and forgive us, O oh Lord. Brothers and sisters in Christ, our Lord has come to make all things new. He has come to bring light into our world, that we might know where we have erred, and that we might see the fullness of grace and truth and love that is all around us. Christ can grant forgiveness of sins to whomever he chooses, and Christ chooses to grant forgiveness to those who humbly submit their truth and their trust in him. And in his name, your sins are forgiven. Amen.
See what I have here today? I've got a band aid. You know, when I was your age, <clears throat> there'd be some times I'd be out playing and I'd be running along and I'd trip and I'd fall, and all of a sudden I would get a big scrape on my elbow and it would be bleeding and it hurt, and I was afraid of all the blood, and so I'd go home and I'd be crying to my mother who would embrace me in her arms and give me that big hug and and then she would wash it out and she would put a band-aid on it. And it wasn't long before I noticed that there was a scab. And then pretty soon it healed and to the point where I didn't even know that, you wouldn't even know that anything had ever happened. And so at a young age I learned, well, wow, isn't that something? We can get a cut. And how that heals and how we thank God for healing. But I was always, it was always so nice to have the comfort and the aid of my mother who certainly was there for me during those times. And then as I got a little bit older, then it was more like going into the emergency room needing stitches or broken bones or having surgery. And so that would come at the aid then of, my, of a doctor and nurses. But still, I noticed that after like six weeks, it healed. And how thankful I was for the healing that God gave to me. And so we think about you know, how God brings healing, but how thankful we are for our, our mothers and or our dads and our doctors and, and our nurses and all who administer care for us in those times when we get those bumps, scrapes, and bruises in life. So let us pray. Dear God, we thank you so much for the gift of healing this day and for those who are in the stewardship and the ministry of aiding and being instruments of your healing. 
And so, Lord, I just thank you for these kids, and we just ask your blessings to be upon them as they grow up, eh, that they may have strong faith in you always. In Jesus we pray. Amen. Well, I've got a treat for each one of you. And as soon as you get a treat, you can go and be seated. Did you get one? Yeah, yeah, go. Yeah, you all be sure to take one, otherwise you know who's going to be eating a lot of candy this week. Take one and pass them down. First reading is from 2 Corinthians, a reading from Paul's second letter to the Corinthians. Now, as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in utmost eagerness, and in our love for you, so we want you to excel also in this generous undertaking. I do not say this as a command, but I am testing the genuineness of your love against the earnestness of others. For you know the generous act of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that by his poverty you might become rich. And in this matter I am giving my advice. It is appropriate for you who began last year not only to do something, but even to desire to do something, now finish doing it, so that your eagerness may be matched by completing it according to your means. For if the eagerness is there, the gift is acceptable according to what one has, not according to what one does not have. I do not mean that there should be relief for others and pressure on you, but it is a question of a fair balance between your present abundance and their need so that their abundance may be for your need, in order that there may be a fair balance. As it is written, the one who has much did not have too much, and the one who had little did not have too little. Word of God, word of life. Oh my God. Oh. 
Please stand for the reading of the Gospel. The Holy Gospel is recorded in Mark chapter 5, verses 21 through 43. When Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a great crowd gathered around him, and he was by the sea. Then one of the leaders of the synagogue named Jairus came, and when he saw him, fell at his feet and begged him repeatedly, My little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her so that she may be well and live. So he went with him. And a large crowd followed him and pressed on him. Now there was a woman who had been suffering from hemorrhages for 12 years. She had endured much under many physicians and had spent all that she had. And she was no better, but rather grew worse. She had heard about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak. For she said, if I but touch his clothes, I will be made well. Immediately her hemorrhage stopped, and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. Immediately aware that power had gone forth from him, Jesus turned about in the crowd and said, Who touched my clothes? And his disciples said to him, You see the crowd pressing in on you? How can you say, Who touched me? He looked all around to see who had done it, but the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came to fear and trembling, fell down before him, and told him the whole truth. He said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. When he was still speaking, some people came from the leader's house to say, Your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the leader of the synagogue, Do not fear, only believe. He allowed no one to follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. When they came to the house of the leader of the synagogue, he saw a commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. When he had entered, he said to them, Why do you make a commotion and weep? The child is not dead, but sleeping. But they laughed at him. Then he put them all outside and took the child's father and mother and those who were with him and went in where the child was. He took her by the hand and said to her, Talitha kum, which means, little girl, get up. And immediately the girl got up and began to walk about. She was 12 years old. At this, they were overcome with amazement. He strictly ordered them that no one should know this and told them to give her something to eat. Here ends the, or this is the gospel of our Lord. Praise Please be seated. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. As we read in Psalm 103, the first three verses, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, and forget not his benefits, who forgives our sins, who redeems our life, who heals us from our diseases. And as we read in Lamentations chapter 3, verse 33, we hear those strong words saying that God does not inflict or grieve his people. In other words, God is pro-healing. God is about health. He wants us to be well. God wages war against sickness. And I have to always remember this because I've heard Christians throughout my whole life who basically say, well, no, it's God who has created all these problems for me. It's God who wielded all this awful stuff as far as injuries, accidents, illnesses. 
and so forth. But that's a lie, and Satan wants us to believe that. God wants us to be whole. God wants us to be well. And so when we think about this um, passage from Mark today, that we hear a story, and then we hear a story within a story. We hear about a um, leader of the synagogue named Jairus, whose daughter becomes deathly ill and eventually dies. But then the story within the story is that there was a woman who had suffered from hemorrhaging for 12 years. And so, first of all, I just want to say there's a theological point in all of this. I mean, Jesus healed so many people. Jesus raised so many people from the dead. So why does Mark have these, mentions these two healings? Well, there's a key to all of this. And it's the number 12. The girl was 12 years of age. The woman was suffering from this chronic illness for 12 years. And so why is the number 12 significant? Because for the Hebrew people, 12 represented the 12 tribes of Israel. It represented the Old Covenant. And so what Mark is trying to get across here is that the Old Covenant is not doing it for people. Life is ebbing away. The law brings judgment and condemns us, and the wages of sin is death, and that the old covenant is dying, and now it has died. But we have hope. And what Jesus is saying is that I am the new covenant. And so for this little girl, it basically embodies the people of Israel and the law. It has died, but now Jesus arisen from the dead that we have life as well. And so, so if you're really wondering, what is the point? Well, that's the point. <laughs> is that the old covenant has died, the new covenant in Christ has come to be, and that's where we have forgiveness, that is where we have life. But nevertheless, I think that there are some points that we can also take from these stories that I think are, are, are worth mentioning. And so one of those would be that Jairus, he was the leader of the synagogue. And so right away, we think, okay, that was emphasized. It wasn't like he was the man who ran the livery downtown or anything of that nature, but that he was the leader of the synagogue. And so right away, we begin to wonder, well, you know, would a leader of the synagogue be for Jesus? I mean, after all, we kind of get the sense that that Jesus was really upsetting the apple cart when it came to being challenged with so many things. I mean, down in Jerusalem, oh, that was hardcore, very strict. The leaders of the temple were very anti-Jesus. Matter of fact, they were spending most of their time, figure, time trying to figure a way to, to bring Jesus down. Actually, they were really working hard to put Jesus to death. Whereas, well, the synagogues, especially up in the region of Galilee, we get the sense that it was more relaxed. They were more open to new teaching, and they would have been more open to having Jesus come and, and share a little bit. But who knows? But the fact that he was the leader of the synagogue, you know, that speaks volumes. And when we are feeling well, when we're living in a house where... Well, there's cool air in the summertime and heat in the wintertime and the roof doesn't leak and we've got a full stomach. Well, you know, we can be big shots at that point. You know, we can sit back and we can say this and we can say that and we can cast judgments on things. But when we're not feeling well or there's somebody in our household that's not feeling well, all of a sudden we're not feeling so strong and mighty anymore. And right now, we're just looking for some, somebody who can help us in this moment. It's not like we go to the emergency room and we're feeling so sick and we're desperate that we don't have a checklist asking the doctor, what religion are you? What's your nationality? What's your race? 
What's your political persuasion? Do you wear your shoes on the right feet? We don't care at this point. If you're the person that can make me well, you're on my team. And that's why I'm here. And so that's a lesson with, with, with Jairus here, is that he doesn't care at this point. My daughter is sick. I'm not in a theological pitter-patter at this point. Jesus can help my daughter. Well, as Jesus and his entourage heads to where the girl is, because at this point they are hearing that, well, the, she's died. And she died. I mean, after all, when they get there, there's all this wailing, you know, and that's part of it. They actually would hire professional people to grieve. I mean, where the wailing, they got sackcloth on them and ashes and, and all of that's going on. She died. But as Jesus is going there, there are all these people who are following him. I mean, hundreds of people are rubbing up against him. But yet, there was a certain touch. There was this gal who had been suffering from chronic illness for 12 years. And she believed that Jesus could make her, her well. And so she touches Jesus and Jesus could feel the power coming from him. And he says, who touched me? And the disciples are saying, Jesus... <laughs> You probably were touched by a hundred people just in this last minute. And how can you ask this question, who touched me? But as a woman who reached out in faith, who believed that Jesus could heal her. And Jesus did. That Jesus is the source of healing. Matter of fact, it would have been nice to have Jesus in town. He's the great physician. Our world has never seen a physician like Jesus. And the thing of it is, is that the price was right. It was free. I don't know if you picked it up as I was reading the gospel, but <laughs> it was saying that the gal had gone to countless, a number of doctors, and had spent all of her money and she wasn't feeling any better. If anything, she was feeling worse. And so we get the sense that the issue of health care was just as big of an issue during Jesus' day as it is now. And so when we think about healing, healing is a gift from God. You know, it's just like anything else. Agriculture, I mean, yeah, it's free from the standpoint that God Gives, is gracious to give us rain and seeds and soil and sunshine. But with everything, God has given a part for humanity to be the stewards of. And so God has blessed us with the farmers. As I see the big combines out on the highway, I can't imagine what one of those costs. But God gives healing, but also... There is the stewardship of healing that God has given to us instruments, people, doctors, medical, technology. And so look at how advanced it has come over 2,000 years. And that's with everything. We pray and that God gives a little bit more of his knowledge and wisdom to help us. And so that we can go now to a doctor or go to the hospital when we're not feeling well. And it's amazing now just how much help there, there is. That there's cures to a lot of things now, or at least relief. I know when I started in the ministry, I knew some cancers where if you got this, it was over. It's, it was hopeless. Whereas now when somebody gets this, more than likely, they're going to be cured. And as I speak, there are scientists working in laboratories who are working on things. I mean, I just look at the coronavirus. Look at how quickly a vaccine came to be. I mean, that's just amazing. It's miraculous. And so many other things as well. I mean, two days ago I was watching the news and, you know, the Lilly Pharmaceutical Company 
You know, I mean, there's a, a very promising drug to help people who are suffering from Alzheimer's disease. I mean, so that's the thing is that, you know, people when they suffer from chronic illness, that now it's like, hang in there, hang in there. Maybe a cure, cure is just right around the corner. And, but still, <laughs> the cost of it, the cost of health care. It's like, well, if I wasn't sick before, now that I got my medical bill, I am really sick. I mean, I've never had this kind of anxiety. I can't sleep at night. I mean, I've got all these health problems now. And they're calling me almost every day. When are you going to pay your bill? I'm going to have a stroke over the whole thing. <clears throat> and so that's an issue for us today, health care. Now here again, don't read into anything more than, than, <laughs> than <laughs> because I'm not here promoting anything. It's just interesting as I, with a little traveling I've done around the world and different parts of the country and, and how every, or, or different parts of the world and how different countries uh, deal with this whole health care thing. But, you know, going to Denmark, Norway, and Sweden, and those would be socialistic, socialist countries. And every year, one of those countries get, gets the tag or the, they get the award of being the happiest people in the world. Why? Because they don't have to worry about all of this. All this is taken care of. When I was in Tromsø, Norway, a, a city above the Arctic Circle, I was eating breakfast in a hotel, and the harbor was right there, and there was a ship that was there, and and the sailors, the crew of the ship, they were eating breakfast there, and so I got into a conversation with a couple of them. And, you know, as they were getting ready, eating breakfast, and ready to go out and patrol the North Sea, kind of like the Coast Guard. But somehow we got talking about this, about health care, and asking about it, and, and they just flat out said, no, we want to make sure that our elderly are taken care of. I mean, for them it wasn't even an argument. This is an instilled value that we have. Well, here again, I mean, we're a capitalistic society, but still, look at how much social programs we have in our society. We got Social Security, we got public schools, we got public roads, we've got, you know, infrastructure, our garbage pickup and our water and sewer and, you know, it just go, think about how, I mean, this is kind of the one thing that's not in under that umbrella is health care. I know in 2010, we had the affordable health care that was passed, and of course, I think generally people say, well, that sure is flawed in so many different ways, but the thing of it is, you've got to start somewhere. You start somewhere, and then you improve upon it. You know, and as we do, that health care is provided for everybody, and, and here again, why should we care? Well, because God cares. God is pro-healing. God is pro-health. God instills that value within us to say, well, maybe this is the way that we can go about it. You know, as I go, you know, I go to the coffee shop and, you know, there's always that guy in the corner who knows everything. And generally he will have the, he'll know what's going to, he knows how to handle this. <laughs> Healthcare. And I just want to say, yes, you got the answer. You know, you need to talk to our representatives and maybe our governor. And the funny thing of it is, is that sometimes that's where the solution comes. There's some guy, some guy sitting in the corner. So don't ever underestimate. If you've got an idea about this, bring it up. Because after all, this is challenging today. We need all the brain power that we can to try to figure all this out. But when it comes to chronic illness, I think the thing that we must always remember, because we pray about it, thinking, oh God, can't you just heal me? An old football injury that just never healed and you know, this disease or whatever it is. I think we all have something. Well, first of all, learn as much as you can about it. Second of all, go to your doctor. See what are your options. Listen to what your doctor prescribes. But are you taking your medicine? No. Well, okay. There's not much we can do at this point then, can we? And to pray, and to be hopeful, and to know that even though the situation may be such today, that doesn't mean that tomorrow it, it will be different. 
And also, don't be always focusing on, well, because of this, I've got limitations, and this is all the things that I can't do now. No, rather, think about what you can do. And to know what you can do for the Lord. How you can bring glory to the Lord. And to know that with God, so there, you, know, you can do so much. With God, all things are possible. But I really think there's a lot of wisdom in what the Apostle Paul what he writes in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7. The Apostle Paul was dealing with something chronic. We don't know what it is, but he called it his thorn in his flesh. And he prayed, and he prayed, and he prayed to the point where he's just saying, God, you know, how many times do I need to pray? And right now, I think my prayers, I'm like at, you know, 10,329 and I still haven't gotten any results. And so finally, God just says to, to Paul, saying, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made known in weakness. In other words, Paul, if I healed you, then you'd have nothing to do with me. But this is your entry point. And understanding that at your entry point, this is where you are going to be the strongest now. Because as we pray to God and as we receive strength from God, that he is helping us build up our, all areas of our lives so that we can compensate for that weakness. And so all of a sudden our weakness is our strength because God is our strength. Not only for us as individuals, but also that we rely on each other as community. I know we have all these people, I don't need the church, I don't need my community, I don't need it. I'm self-made. Yeah, right. Until all of a sudden we have a problem, it's good to have a community that we can lean on, who can give us all these supports that we need. And so, God's grace is sufficient for us, and we pray. And every time we pray, there's always a little healing that takes place for our body, our mind, and our spirit. Amen. i 
in His righteousness alone, faultless stand before the throne. Well, today is a very special day in the life of St. Paul's Lutheran Church and that we are installing Andrew Moss as the director for Cornerstone Life Center. And so I call Andrew up at this time. Mm -hmm. oh, excuse me. Lindsay and Parker, if you'd like to come forward too. Okay. They do work as a team. I do know that. After prayerful deliberation, we of St. Paul's Lutheran Church certify that Andrew Moss has been appointed to work as director of Cornerstone Life Center. Our Lord, who came among us as a servant, calls us to faith and a life of loving service to our neighbor. We stand among us as one called to render a particular service a gift from God to inspire us to love and good works. And so a reading from Romans chapter 12. Just as each of our bodies has several parts, and each part has a separate function, so all of us, in union with Christ, from one, from one body and as parts of it, we belong to each other. Our gifts differ according to the grace given us. If your gift is prophecy, then use it, as your faith suggests. If administration, then use it for administration. If teaching, then use it for teaching. Let the preachers deliver sermons. The almsgivers give freely. The officials be diligent. And those who do works of mercy do them cheerfully. So Andrew, will you assume this ministry in the confidence that it comes from God? And so respond by saying, I will, and I ask God to help me. I will, and I ask God to help me. Will you carry out this ministry in accordance with the teachings and practice of the Lutheran Church? And so respond by saying, I will, and I ask God to help me. I will, and I ask God to help me. Will you be diligent in your study of the Holy Scriptures and faithful in your use of the means of grace and in prayer? And so respond by saying, I will. And I ask God to help me. I will, and I ask God to help me. Will you trust in God's care, seek to grow in love for those you serve, strive for excellence in your skills, and adorn the gospel of God with a godly life? If so, respond by saying, I will, and I ask God to help me. I will, and I ask God to help me. Almighty God, who has given you the will to do these things, graciously give you the strength and compassion to perform them. Andrew Moss, I install you as director of the Cornerstone Life Center in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty and ever-living God, as you, as you called apostles and evangelists, pastors and teachers to instruct, comfort, admonish, and care for us, so you have, so you have been called you know, to be the servant. And so, Lord, we just pray this day that you will fill Andrew with wisdom and patience, with love and with faithfulness to your word, that he may be shown your love and your grace, and that he may instruct and lead with gladness, and that he, you will be with him, as he brings comfort, counsel, and guide your people in the maturity in Christ Jesus, your Son, our Lord. Amen. And so I want you, Andrew, to turn and face the congregation. We are just so thankful to have Andrew as our new director of Cornerstone. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you, Andrew, very much. Mm -hmm. Okay, well. Continue with our statement. Please join me. We believe in God, creator of infinite wisdom and power, 
whose love points the direction of the universe and whose concern is for all of us. We believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God and the Savior of the world. Jesus is the true gift of the Creator's love. Jesus is the reason for our hope and the promise of forgiveness of sin and eternal life. We trust Him. We believe the Holy Spirit of God is present with us, keeping us aligned to the truth of the scriptures and the example of Jesus our Lord. We believe our relationship with God is born out of grace and acted out through deeds of love and mercy through the Church of Christ. We can experience the true love of God in prayer, the sacraments, the word, and the community of believers. We desire that the presence of God would come to all people and the joy of Christ would be ours forever. Amen. And let us pray. Merciful Lord, you grant your spirit to the church that it might be Christ's body in the world. And you call us to be your body in the midst of a world with so much brokenness, so much need, that we often, like the Lord, feel surrounded, inundated by these needs, as Jesus was among the crowds. We pray by your spirit that we, as church, would trust in your power going out from us, would trust that by your power, we can accompany those who are suffering. We can share with them your light and your grace and your truth. And through this, they can find strength and joy for the days to come. Lord, in your mercy, and God of creation, all around us is the beauty that you provide to sustain to nurture, to enlighten. We thank you for the resources that you give us in nature. We thank you for the resources that you give us in science. And we thank you for the stewards of those resources. Researchers, doctors, nurses, all who work in healthcare, all who take these raw materials that you make possible so that others can have abundant life and hope. We pray that you would strengthen them in their work. We pray that you would strengthen all of us as stewards of gifts that we have. Gifts to heal, gifts to share, gifts to encourage. Lord, in your mercy. God of the nations, we pray for those who are appointed to positions of leadership, we pray for our elected leaders locally, state, federally. We pray that you would guide them to serve with humility, to serve with wisdom, to remember that their decisions are helping and affecting those most vulnerable, those who, as Pastor Jeff shared in his sermon, those who are beyond the petty questions and simply need our help and our strength. Lord, in your mercy. God of life and love, we pray for others, others on our minds and others on our hearts who are also in a place of deep need, a place where other agendas and backgrounds and affiliations do not matter. Only that others are for them. Only that others can offer life and healing. We pray for those who grieve, including the Jardine family and the Christensen family. We pray for Bob Priest and for all others who are overcoming illnesses or injuries. And we pray that you would inspire us as your body to minister to them as we find opportunity. Lord, in your mercy. 
into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for which we pray, trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Jesus said, Peace I leave with you, and my peace I give to you. May the peace of the Lord be with you always. Let's take a minute to share the peace of Christ with those around us. yours. Put us to what you will. Rank us alongside whomever you choose. Put us to use in doing, in suffering for your will to be done, whether we find our hearts exalted or brought low. Keep us mindful that we are yours. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to God. Holy God, mighty Lord, gracious Father, endless is your mercy and eternal your reign. You have filled all creation with light and life. Heaven and earth are full of your glory. We praise you for the grace shown to your people in every age. The promise to Israel rescue from Egypt, the gift of the promised land, the words of the prophets, and at this end of all the ages, the gift of your Son. He proclaimed the good news in word and deed, and was obedient to your will, even to giving his life. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, he gave thanks, he broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Again after supper he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people, for the forgiveness of your sins. Do this in remembrance of me. Let us pray the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name.
You're all welcome to the table of the Lord. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before, O oh my soul, I worship Your holy name. The sun comes up, it's a new day dawning. It's time to sing your song again. Whatever may pass and whatever lies before me, let me be singing when the evening comes. That's the Lord of my soul, oh my soul, worship His holy name. Like never before, oh my soul, I worship your holy name. You're rich in love and you're slow to anger. Your grace is great and your heart is kind. For all your goodness, I will keep on seeing. Ten thousand reasons for my heart to find. Bless the Lord of my soul, oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before, oh my soul, I worship Your holy name. Please stand. May the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ give you strength and preserve you to eternal life. Peace the Lord be with you always. Amen. Amen. One. Two. Oh, I'm we'll go a little faster than that. One, two, three, four. You are not alone in 